And now, join us for the 15th annual Ernest J. Gaines Award for Literary Excellence. Hello, Nathan. This is Victor Laval, a former Ernest J. Gaines Award winner. Just saying congratulations to you on this well-deserved win, and uh, welcome to the family. Congratulations, Nathan, and welcome to the family of winners and the larger community of great folks associated with this award. It's an outstanding achievement, and one of which I hope you feel extraordinarily proud. Again, I congratulate you. Hey, Nathan. Uh, congratulations on your well-deserved win, your excellent book, and I uh, wish we could all celebrate in Baton Rouge together. Uh, but this is just the beginning, man. So wishing you nothing but the best. Nathan, huge congratulations for winning this year's Ernest Gaines Prize for Literary Excellence. I want to welcome you into the family of former Gaines Prize winners and illustrious list, if I do say so myself. I hope this is the beginning of a spectacular literary career. And uh, yeah, congratulations again, man. I hope you really enjoy this prize and savor this moment. Hello, Nathan. This is Ravi Howard. I just wanted to congratulate you on your win of the Gaines Award for the Sweetness of Water. Really enjoyed um, getting to know you through the book and your writing voice. So congrats and all best. To our past winners, a big thanks. All of you have lived up to the promise of the Ernest J. Gaines Award for Literary Excellence. You have continued to write and tell stories that matter. Stories that help the rest of us make sense of the world we live in. I'm John Davies. I'm President and CEO of the Baton Rouge Area Foundation. I have the privilege of telling you about the Gaines Award and this year's winner. The award began more than 15 years ago. The foundation wanted to honor Mr. Gaines, who was among the greatest writers of his generation. He told stories about his family and the place he came from. He wanted others to know of the big lives lived by people in anonymous towns in the South. Mr. Gaines passed away in late 2019. One of the hallmarks of his stories is what scholars call voice. It's a literary term that eludes easy definition, but you know what it is. It's the poetry in his work. Ernest was honored and delighted by the award, the Ernest Gaines Literary Award because it, it gave attention to struggling new young writers. And he remembered so well how difficult it was for him in the beginning. I'm sitting at Ernest's desk, which is where he often sit, sat to write. But this is the room that he used most of all. As you can see, he has photographs on his desk and um, there are books behind him that he could reach very easily. And it was just a comfortable, happy place for him to, to be. He also loved meeting the, um, the writers, all of them, and reading their new books. It gave him a great deal of pleasure was just something that he enjoyed tremendously. All of us did. With me today is Marianne Sternberg, who frequently took award winners to visit at the Gaines home. Tell us your impressions of the Gaines. Ernest and Diane, his wife, were so warm and hospitable. It was a real pleasure to be there. And each of the winners was so excited to meet Ernest in person because, of course, he was one of their literary heroes. So it was fun for me and probably other people in the room to watch these two generations of writers talking about themselves and their experiences and telling their stories. Tell me, how did the Book Award get started in the first place, and, and what was the goal of the Book Award? The mission initially, of course, was to identify uh, the best emerging African-American fiction writer, have their publishers submit books, and then we had a wonderful panel of national literary judges who selected the winner. And through the years, uh, the, the award has grown in national prominence. It's now one of the best known 
awards of its kind in the country, which is wonderful. And so we've had more and more submissions. And the winners have gone on after they've won the Gaines Award to do all sorts of other things. Dina Mengestu was selected as a MacArthur Genius Award winner. Crystal Wilkinson has been appointed as the Poet Laureate in Kentucky. Victor Lavelle's second novel has been optioned for a series by Apple TV. It strikes me, having watched this over the years, that in addition to having this delightful meal and visit with the Gaines uh, at their home, that the second most important event was Gentleman Jack in the Green Room. And typically, the award winners would be back there with them and tails and yarns would spin. And it was a magical moment that led then to wonderful chemistry on stage when Mr. Gaines and the award winner both managed to sit together and, and, and discuss the book at hand. When Ernest was alive and able to be at the event, it added a certain magic to it. Um, I think the crowd appreciated that I th and, and certainly uh, the award winner did. We also, as you remember, were able to have Danny Plaisance of Cottonwood Books, who join us every year and bring the winner's books. And after the program, uh, he sold the books the winner uh, sat and autographed books. For hours and hours for and hours. For a long time, <laughs> yes. I remember we were in the reception more than once looking around for our award winner and he or she was still out in the lobby signing books because so many people wanted an autograph and uh, wanted to chat with him. Here's to being together next year. Here's to being together next year. Also, uh, the award grew through the years because we added an in-school component. The award winner went into schools and spoke to students and uh, this was done by Lynn Mitchell, who is a writer and educator and has spent an inordinate amount of time on this aspect. Sometimes the students had never heard a writer in person before. They didn't know that writing could be a career, and they didn't know that a writer could be a real person like them. So I think some got inspired. And Lynn also developed a student essay contest the essays were judged by local literary people, but the winners, school students from elementary through high school, came to the event and got to walk on the stage and be applauded and get a little check. And it was just one more additional element of serving the mission of the award, uh, which was encouraging good writing in the shadow and now in the legacy of Ernest Gaines. <laughs> And here is this year's award winner, Nathan Harris, author of The Sweetness of Water. I just want to first and foremost thank the Baton Rouge Area Foundation um, and all the judges. I want to thank uh, Gaines family. And I uh, just want to say, you know, carrying on Mr. Gaines' legacy in whatever way I can, that's, uh, I think, the ultimate honor. So. I'm gonna do my best to do that. Um, you know, the road of being a writer, especially a young writer can be a dark and lonely one, I think. And you're alone a lot and you're just sitting with the work and you don't you know the quality of it or how it'll be received. And I think getting an award like this is the ultimate acknowledgement that you're on the right path, that um, you're, you're, you're doing good and that you should continue to contribute to uh, to uh, you know, the writing world. So yeah, I just wanna thank everybody who's been involved in, in doing this award. I'm gonna do my best to carry on Mr. Gaines' legacy going forward. So thank you again. Congratulations, Nathan. We're so proud of you, as are so many other people. And I know that the Washington Post book critic called your book a miracle, and that Oprah Winfrey selected the book for her global book club. And therefore, your novel soared onto the New York Times bestseller list. And if that wasn't enough, in December, 
The Sweetness of Water was recommended by Barack Obama when he listed his favorites for the year. So with our Gaines Award, we're looking forward to this year and beyond, and we know that the $15,000 prize that comes with the award will help you complete your second book, which we're looking forward to. Nathan is in Seattle. Tony Grooms, one of our five national literary judges, happens to be across the country in Atlanta. But through the miracle of modern technology, I am delighted to turn the program over to Tony for a conversation with Nathan. Well, Nathan Harris, welcome to the Gaines Award Program. We're happy to have you with your extraordinary debut novel, which of course is the 2021 award-winning novel, The Sweetness of Water. But let's start by having you tell us a little bit about yourself. I understand that you grew up in Oregon. What part of Oregon? Originally from Southern Oregon, a small town called Ashland. Um, not, not too much there. It's a, it's a very small town, but we, we do have a, a Shakespeare festival that people come from all over to see. So um, it was an interesting time growing up where, you know, there's a, kind of a, a lot of culture in, in a small space. And, and my dad made it a point to take me to the plays and kind of, um, you know, immerse me in that sort of world. So I think that was one small part of uh, becoming a storyteller. Um, but it was, it was a lovely, it was a love, it was a lovely place. You know, I still love it. So yeah, that's how. Yeah. So I'm interested in your relationship with your father, who is a writer too. Tell us a little bit about your father, please. Yeah, absolutely. Um, he's had quite the ride. He always wanted to be a writer. He started, uh, having kids early. I have four half siblings. Um, and he had his first child when he was 18. So, you know, he always had to have a, a day job and often a night job. So he never got to really fulfill the dream until he was older. And then uh, I think he was in his 40s when he wrote a book of short stories. Reading time at night was always my dad telling me a story. And he was kind of like Shahrazad. He would, he would, end on a end on a cliffhanger you know and he'd say oh tomorrow I'll, I'll finish it and um i just we always just had that connection and he always felt like he didn't get to although we had a book of short stories he never got to live um the full writer's life if you will and um, he often says that you know me being his last child i kind of uh, embodied everything that he wanted to to do and, um, you know, he couldn't be prouder of me. Tell me a little bit about your mother. What's her background? She always, she herself wanted to be a painter, actually. Kind of in the same way my dad wanted to be a writer. But my grandfather was one of those parents who was like, I think it was, you can either be a doctor or an attorney, you know, and that's it. And she decided to become an attorney. Um, and so she had to give up this, this path of painting that she always um, really wanted to go down. And uh, my dad was actually a clerk in the Los Angeles County court system. And she was an attorney. She was a prosecutor there. So that's how they met. Um, and um, yeah, they just had this uh, entirely varied cast of kids. They always were behind me 110%. And I you know, couldn't be more grateful because I wouldn't be where I am today without them. And you studied first in Oregon, at the University of Oregon, just down the road from Ashland. And then you went to Texas to the Michelin Center. Was that your first time uh, in the South or the Southwest? Yeah, I mean, in general, it's, it's I don't I don't even think about Texas as the South in that way. And the Southwest mm -hmm. feels so different from the South. Mm -hmm. I spent a little time in Atlanta. My friend graduated from uh, the military academy there. But that's the only time I've really spent in the South. And going to Texas, um, that, that was certainly my first time in Texas. <laughs> it was kind of a culture shock. Um, I really enjoyed it. But in terms of my time in the South, yeah, it's, it's, it's very limited. And of course, you were in Texas at the Michelin Center, which is a very prestigious place for a young writer to be. 
I'm interested in how you interacted with the South, uh, particularly because the setting of your story is in Georgia and is in the 19th century. And my understanding is that you have not lived in Georgia. What kind of preparation did you do to create the details of that story? Quite a bit. Um, it's I set myself a task that um, I think a lot of debut authors might um, best avoid in a way, because it's just very intimidating. We're talking about people who have entirely different lifestyles than I grew up having. Um, again, a place I haven't been to really at all. But I just decided that if this was the plot and these are the characters and this is the story I had to tell, that I couldn't shy away from it. And, these, you know, I, I went to sleep thinking about these people and I woke up thinking about them and I would think, you know, well, you're not the person to tell this story. But it, if I didn't tell it, who would? You know, it's the story I had. So I just kind of, you know, jumped in, you know, I jumped into reading about, you know, the history of, of, of the South. Um, you know, I mean, I was reading because I decided I wanted to be about this farm. You know, I was I was reading these old agricultural magazines, you know, that came out during that time. I, I was just diving into whatever could give me just a, a sense of how these people lived, um, how they behaved day to day, um, dialects, that sort of thing. And um, I just took it. I took it upon myself that I had the responsibility to make it as authentic as possible, so people enjoyed this book and they they went along with it. So. It, it was very difficult, but I, I read as much as I could. And when it was time to tell a story, I just, I put it all away. And I said, you know, you know, and you just have to, just have, have to hope it works. And uh, the sweetness of water is what came from that. And you created the character, George Walker, who's a bit of an eccentric character. Can you tell us a little bit about George? I think I think one thing that will come up a lot in our conversation is this idea of, you know, just trying to recognize that we are all the same in some way and some idea of empathy can get you pretty far, you know, and I, I think George Walker, if I had an out in finding a character that I can sort of understand, having this person who's from the north, I mean, he was from the northeast, I suppose, but, you know. It, it, this person who is um, out of, you know, out of place there, if you will. He's an outcast. And um, on a greater level, we've all felt like an outcast at some point. So I sort of had this idea of how he would engage with people because we've all felt that way. And in another way, I sort of felt like, how would I feel if I just moved to the South? And, you know, again, engaging with these people who have a totally different way of, of living life than I do. So I mean, yeah, in, a, in, a, in an odd way, there is a lot of there is a lot of me and George, and I I, I, I kind of imagine being this outsider in the South through his eyes. Then George, of course, grew up with an enslaved person as his servant, so he wasn't unfamiliar with slavery, and yet he doesn't fit in into the in the slavery society, and then you create formerly enslaved people who are looking for a way out of this. Uh, I just, well, tell me a little bit about the brothers. Absolutely. Prentice and Landry. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they're the crux of the story in some ways. You know, I have, I have, uh, you know, again, uh, Oh, I have a lot of half brothers, but my three, three full brothers that I that I grew up with, you know, when I was writing those those chapters, you know, they were they were close to my heart. I know what that relationship is like, and I think beyond that, the 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 driving force of the question behind this book is what the world would be like. How would how would they maintain their bond? How would their bond change when they're entering this period of of being free, you know, when they've lived their whole life in bondage. And I, I had no idea. And I kind of, I kind of avoided reading about, um, you know, freed slaves on some level, um, because I, I wanted to create it for myself. 
um, I wanted to create that emotional charge on the page just based off, you know, what was coming from my heart. Um, so yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it all started with them and, um, everything sort of sprouted from that first scene when they're together in the woods and all, you know, George comes upon them. They only have each other. Um, and yeah, that, that was, uh, that was the jumping off point for everything in the series of water. It's a wonderful, wonderful novel in particular, the part about the brothers. I won't give it away because I want people to get the book and get immersed in it, enjoy it. But I want to talk about some literary influences. Uh, uh, who uh, do you read? Who is it that uh, has helped you shape your literary voice? There's there's endless names. Um, I, I often come back when I'm thinking about this to, to a few. I mean, for me, uh, James McBride, The Good Lord Bird, that's one of my uh, favorite novels. And there's, <laughs> there's a lot of people in that book who are, who are you know, the, I think, you know, Frederick Douglass is in the book, you know, there's just, there's so many real people and he has fun with them, you know, and he um, just, he made them into what, what he needed them to be in the book on a comedic level. And, you know, there's not a lot of comedy in my book, but um, knowing that uh, an author of his stature um, provided himself the flexibility to, you know, use the past how he wishes, um, it told me that, like, yeah, you, you can just do what you want here, you know? And I, I again, I wanted to adhere to some you know, level of authenticity, but you don't want to feel strapped to it to a way where the story can't develop on its own. So he sort of... I don't know, in a way I sort of feel him like tapping me on the shoulder and being like, go ahead, do as, do as you will, you know? And uh, Ed, Edward P. Jones, I mean, the known world is, that's everything to me. Uh, I read that, it's it's been years, but when I read that and his assurance in depicting that time period, and again, the idea of um, Black people owning slaves, which I had no idea about, and offering this glimpse um, into um, this entirely different um, world during that that time, that that was that was huge to me. It strikes me that these are two very very different approaches to the 19th century. Uh, one is comedic, and the other dramatic. Uh, I would like to mention that one of the judges is Edward P. Jones. Uh, who perhaps saw something of himself in your work. Crazy. Dreams dreams come true. Somebody who I never thought I'd be spoken of in the same breath in, in any capacity, even if he's just, you know, judging this. But uh, yeah, I just it just makes me smile. Probably also you didn't expect to be mentioned in the same breath as Oprah Winfrey. Well, I understand that Oprah did give you a call. Can you tell us something about that? That was a that was a wild period in my life. Um, the book the book had not come out yet, and there was a lot of whispering from my editor and uh, my publicist, and they just kind of told me something's happening. And uh, I'm somebody who I get very anxious. I get very worried. I was thinking, what did I do wrong? What is happening here? Um, what can I do to fix it? And I was just pacing back and forth in my, my apartment. And it had been going on for days. So I was very worried. I have a lot of, uh, I get a lot of health anxiety issues. And I actually, uh, I, I broke out into hives. And I was convinced that I, it was going to grow into some very serious problems. So here I am literally driving to uh, urgent care because I think I'm going to have some sort of terrible reaction that's going to get worse and worse. And then I get a phone call from who but Oprah Winfrey herself. And it's all revealed that this was, she had been reading the book the whole time, um, chunk by chunk and deciding if she wanted to make it a choice for her and they couldn't tell me. So I had a lovely, lovely conversation with Oprah outside of a urgent care facility, uh, pacing outside of the facility. And, you know, at first you think uh, this is insane. And then after that, you sort of listen to her and you have this conversation with somebody who is so grounded and so down to earth and just loves literature, you know, in this um, very 
human way. She was just a fan. So, you know, to hear her quoting different parts of the book and talking about how she wants to share it with so many people, she's handing out copies. I mean, what, what do you say? I don't know. It's um, I, it, I'm still speechless to this day thinking about it. And it's it's been such a whirlwind. And I just, I think of her as just, a, a, again, one fan of so many who love the book, but I'm so glad that she was willing to, um, you know, use her platform to amplify um, my work. And I'll always be grateful for her doing that. Oprah, I think, is a balm for all ages. Yeah. She, the book has also had many other accolades. It's on President Obama's reading list, for example, and a Booker long list. Uh, and the Booker is not extended very often to Americans, and certainly not for first novels. Um, you just, yeah, you don't expect these things with your debut novel. So, as I was saying before, I mean, you, you spend years and years, you know, uh, by yourself with this little, this little world you've created on the page, you know, and then you send it out. And to go from yeah, Oprah to Obama to the Booker, um, you know, to be long listed for the you know Carnegie Medal for excellence in fiction for so many things, yeah, it's just it's it's just um, it's just tells me that I'm I'm doing something right, and I'm, I need I need to continue to do that, and I want to just share more books with people, and um, even if they don't enjoy it as much, that's okay, you know, I'm a uh, I've I've crested high. I'm due for a little bit of a low. Maybe maybe there'll be more criticism to come, and I I, I could care less. You know, just being able to have the privilege of, of writing this book and writing other books that's that's everything to me. Just getting to practice um, my craft, just I feel blessed. Well, certainly the Gaines jury thought that the book deserved all of the accolades that it's getting. We're very proud that we can support debut African American novels. So I want to know what your ambitions for this book are. You are now you have an audience. What do you want the audience to get from the book? That's it's a great question. I think I think the easiest answer is that I truly I truly do want readers to have that that experience of when you enter into this book. I always talk about that moment when you're a kid and you're under the covers, you have your little flashlight and you're reading, you don't want to put the book down. That is, that's the best feeling in the world as a writer to know somebody's having that almost childlike experience that I can't put the book down. I got to know how this ends and it's the ultimate compliment. And beyond that, I just, I tried to create a novel here that, I mean, I, I call it a, I call it a communal novel because I think everybody can see parts of themselves in it, whether it's George being an outcast, Isabel grieving, the brothers deciding what comes next. I mean, haven't we all felt that way at some part in our lives where we have this huge transformation? What, what are you, what are we going to do? Um, but, but this book is also populated by whoever's reading it. You know, they're going to see characters that are nothing like them. And I hope, I hope they see the humanity in people who aren't like them. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you might be working on now? I'm working on um, another novel. It's historical fiction or around the same time. And, uh, you know, Tobias Wolf talks about how you don't want to speak about a work too much that's not finished or else it'll harden and it'll just crack into pieces. So I can't give up too much. And I think I'd be doing a disservice to people who love sweetness by giving up too much because there's, I, I mean, I don't know. I think they'll enjoy it more by not knowing those things. But it was important for me on some level to, um, you know, to to my to my audience, give them more of what they enjoyed on some level. And um, I had another story that I felt like deserved to be told. Um, you know, parts of history that I don't think have been covered enough. And I'm still figuring it out day to day, so I can't even articulate it fully, but I hope by the time it comes out, um, you know, it's all there laid out on the page and people can enjoy another another story that they, that they come to really love. Well, Nathan Harris, I enjoyed reading your debut novel, The Sweetness of Water, 
and I look forward to whatever is coming next. Good luck to you, and I hope to hear from you again soon. Thank you so much, Tony. And once again, I want to thank the Foundation for putting this on and everybody who, who helped make this happen. And uh, hopefully we'll be talking again soon at some point. It is an honor to be a judge once more for the Ernest J. Gaines Award for Literary Excellence. Your novel tells a story so much needed today in these divisive times. It's a story of love, of forgiveness and reconciliation, but you left me feeling hopeful, hopeful for the future of race relations in America. So bravo, Nathan Harris. Hi, I'm Francine Prose, and I'm here to congratulate Nathan Harris on winning the Gaydens Award for his novel, The Sweetness of Water. It's a beautiful novel. The Gaydens Award is a great honor. I was very, very proud to be one of the judges who helped select the book. And I wish Nathan Harris great luck with this book and with all the books that we all hope he'll write after this one. I'm Patricia Towers, one of the judges for the Ernest Gaines Award. And today I'm delighted to congratulate you, Nathan Harris, as the winner of the 2021 award for your strong, evocative debut novel. Beautifully imagined, richly drawn, deeply empathetic. It's a visionary book. Your characters, intimately understood by you, feel real and relevant to our own challenging times. Luckily for us, you're a young man with many books to write. I'm extremely re eager to read what comes next. On behalf of the Baton Rouge Area Foundation, we congratulate Nathan Harris once again and thank all of you whose continuing interest has helped us present the Ernest J. Gaines Award for Literary Excellence. The Ernest J. Gaines Award for Literary Excellence was brought to you by the Baton Rouge Area Foundation. The foundation serves more than two million people across South Louisiana. It provides services to philanthropists and leads projects for civic good. Learn more about the foundation at braf.org.